Well, this psalm, Psalm 45, is one of the royal psalms, as you may have guessed. It is about the king of Israel or Judah. Now, the kings were anointed, uh, a physical symbol of God's choice of them as his representative to the people. And so these psalms speak to us about far more than the human kings. They speak about the kingship of God, but also about the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus. This particular royal psalm is unique because it is a love song, a wedding song. Tradition says it was written for Solomon's marriage to the princess of Egypt. We don't know that for sure, but it was certainly used for royal weddings throughout the generations. And we see in the introductory verse, verse 1, that the psalmist's heart is overflowing. He's inspired by the Spirit and he sings this pleasing or noble theme. And the theme of his song is the Bridegroom King. He describes the king as the most handsome of the sons of men. 1 Samuel 16 uh, is about Samuel going to David's father's house to anoint the future king. And, And we read in that chapter that David was indeed handsome. But the verse that's probably best known in that chapter is when Samuel is looking at David's rather impressive older brothers. And God says to him, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And actually in this psalm, the beauty that is described here is not physical beauty. It is beauty of character and deed. The NIV translation is that he is the most excellent. And I think that captures that idea very well. There are are three things that we're going to highlight Three aspects of this beauty. And as we go, we'll see how each one applies to Jesus. The first beautiful thing is there in verse 2. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. This is a king who speaks beautiful words. He's a king who speaks like no other, with grace and with godliness. And if you think about some of Judah's kings, you think, well, that clearly doesn't apply to them. Some of them were horrible, horrible people. And it's very hard to imagine this being sung at the wedding of Manasseh, for example, one of the worst But it is fairly straightforward, I think, to see how this applies to Jesus. Jesus spoke like no other. That's because he spoke the words that his father gave him. He himself said in John's Gospel, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father has taught me. And then he says later, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Many recognized the uniqueness of this gracious, godly speech of Jesus. There was an incident again in John's Gospel where the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. And they came back empty handed and the Pharisees said, what are you doing? And they said... Well, we couldn't arrest him. Why? No one ever spoke like this man. To those with ears to hear, Jesus himself said that his words are spirit and life. If we've listened, we know this to be true, that he is the king who speaks beautiful words. I love how Charles Spurgeon put it 
when writing about this psalm, he said of Jesus, often a sentence from his lips has turned our midnight into morning, our winter into spring. The king speaks beautiful words. But the second beautiful thing that the king does here is perhaps more surprising. And that is his warfare. Now we can imagine as verse 3 says. A king riding out to war in splendor and majesty. Something that is fearsome and awesome and majestic to see. But but beautiful? How is warfare beautiful? Well look at the cause that he fights for. This king is not going out in self-interest. He's not battling his, for his own honour. He rides out for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Or truth, humility and justice. And these things indicate what he is fighting against as well. He overcomes lies with truth. He conquers pride with humility. He defeats all wickedness with righteousness and justice. Now again, it's hard to relate this to the kings in David's line. Their best motives were tainted with selfishness. Their most honourable actions were marred with unjust violence. David himself was not afraid to put someone in the front line to ensure he was killed to cover over his own adultery. The kings were not beautiful warriors. But Jesus is a warrior like no other. A warrior of matchless beauty. His war was not waged with the sword against human enemies... Not even those who betrayed and crucified him. His war was against the lies of the devil. Against the pride that is at the root of sin. Against all wickedness and unrighteousness. Against sin and death and hell. Against all the effects of the fall. And he won that battle by the ultimate act of humility. Putting aside his glory. Becoming human, submitting to death on a cross for the sin of the whole world. We're exhorted to do the same, just as we're called to speak words that are like salt in the world, bringing grace. We are called in Romans twelve twenty one to overcome evil with good. Now, Paul doesn't say there, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome it with good. He says, do not be overcome by evil. When we use evil to fight, or in, in, in the mistaken thought that we are fighting evil, we have been overcome. He's saying, no, overcome evil with good. And Peter's first letter gives many examples of how this is to be done. It's worth going and reading through that short letter and thinking about the different contexts in which we are called to live lives that show grace. It is part of that beautiful warfare that we are called to. And it is all in the context of the example of Jesus, the beautiful and victorious warrior. Because that's what we see in the psalm, isn't it? This, this warfare is victorious. And it leads to a beautiful reign. There's some wonderful description of this from the, the end of verse 7. We have these images of the oil of gladness. We've got fragrant robes, ivory palaces, stringed instruments. We've got the ladies of honour. We've got the Queen Mother there dressed in the finest gold. These are beautiful things, but they are not what encapsulates the reign of this king. 
These things all follow the way in which the king reigns. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Right behavior is upheld in the reign of this king. Evil is punished. The king's rule is just in intention and in action. He is a king after God's own heart. And when people look at the reign of this king, they see the kingdom of God. And again, we look at the Old Testament kings and look in vain to find a king who reigned like that. But God's Old Testament people could sing this psalm honestly, with integrity, because they looked forward to that king who was promised in David's line, to the Messiah who would reign eternally in perfect righteousness. Think of the prophecy of Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it. And to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. These words can be speaking of no one but Jesus. Jesus is the one who loves righteousness and hates wickedness. And who rules with a scepter of uprightness. And it is in Jesus that we can make sense of the first half of verse 6. Because there's a very strange word used there. The psalmist is still speaking to the king. And he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It seems to be addressing the king as God and describing his throne as eternal. And in some way you might say, well, he's just kind of speaking to the king as God's representative. As the representative of God's rule. But there's more, of course. And we know that through Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1 quotes these verses and directly applies them to Jesus. It is only... With a right understanding of Jesus as the man who is God. The king on the eternal throne. Fully human, fully divine. It is only when we look to him that we can understand the deeper meaning of this psalm. Because there has never been and will never be a king like him. And then in verse 10, the psalmist turns to the bride. Now, in a wedding song, a love song, you might expect a little bit more balance between the descriptions of the bride and the groom. If you read the Song of Songs there, you'll find that bride and groom are treated pretty much equally in how they're described and and so on. But here, the king is very much the focus. And everything that is said to the bride is said in relation to the king. And we might think this is a bit harsh on this bride. Particularly when we look at how verse 10 begins. Because the psalmist doesn't start by complimenting the bride. This isn't like uh, one of those speeches that you get at a wedding. Where the best man or whoever has to stand up and say how beautiful the bride and the bridesmaids and the mother of the bride and everyone else is. It's not like that. He doesn't compliment the bride. He commands the bride. Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. He says basically three times in three different ways, listen. It is a strong command here. Forget your people and your father's house and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow down 
to him. In some ways, this is no different to the call that is on all people who are committing to marriage. Marriage is a husband and wife leaving their old family and old life to form a new family unit. We read about that in Ephesians 5. We, we can't go into, into it in depth here in relation to husbands and wives. But in that chapter, Paul writes about how human marriage is a picture of the relationship between Christ, the eternal royal bridegroom, and the church, his bride. The wife is called to submission. The husband is called to love There is no cruel domination here. It is a beautiful devotion to one another. And yet here in Psalm 45, the king is described as the bride's lord. The one to whom she should bow. Perhaps not surprising because her her husband is the king. She's her king as well as her husband. But again, I think we only can really understand the true depth of this when we see the king as Jesus. When we see the bride as the church. Because what we have here is a call to discipleship. Forget your people and your father's house. It is the call to leave behind our old life, to die to it, and to be raised to new life in Christ with Jesus as both our Saviour and Lord. The one that we submit to because he loves us with an everlasting love, with a love that cannot be broken. But we don't just have a command here because this call to submission to the king also comes with a promise. Now we know it is not easy to leave everything behind. Jesus makes this very evident when he says these words. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You see within that challenge there is a promise. Within the exhortation to give up the old life there is the encouragement. That when we lose our life. When we die to self. To all of our old priorities and cares and concerns. Our life is saved. That actually in losing everything, we are losing nothing. We gain everything. Paul put it like this in Philippians 3. He talks about his earthly status and privilege. And then he says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Whatever gain we have, we count as loss. Why? Because we have righteousness. Because we know the power of his resurrection. Because we have gained Christ and are found in him. The bride loses nothing of true value and gains everything. And if we look at how the bride is described from verse 13, I think we can, we can see something of this. Because she's not described 
with any description of physical beauty. He doesn't talk about her stature, her face, anything like that. He talks about the beauty with which she has been dressed. He talks about the beauty of her clothes. He talks about a beauty that has been given to her. And that's really significant. Because this is exactly the same for the bride of Christ, for the church. All our beauty, glory, virtue, righteousness, it has been given to us by the grace of God. Going back to Ephesians 5 and that that passage on marriage. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the, wor- with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. The perfection of the bride of Christ, the people of God, comes only as God sanctifies us, makes us holy, makes us like Christ. And when we jump to the end of the Bible and those incredible visions of the return of Christ, we see the same thing in chapter 19. John heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. It says there the bride clothed herself. But it was granted to her. She is given the righteousness to wear. She is given the beautiful wedding clothes. That she needs. It is God himself through the work of Christ. Who provides what is required. To make his people a fitting bride for the king. And then in chapter 21, we get that incredible image. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And when the husband is Jesus, the son of God, that preparation is perfect, is beautiful beyond compare. One of my favourite hymns is one that I have never before sung in church, in any church, and I I think we should change that. Uh, It's a a hymn written almost 200 years ago by the great Dundee preacher Robert Murray McShane. And the hymn is called, When This Passing World Is Done. And one of the verses says this, When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty, not my own, When I see you as you are, love you with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. The clothes are given to us. The beauty is given to us. And actually that hymn, it takes us from the bride's beauty to her new home. Verse 15 tells us she has a place In the palace of the king. Philippians 3. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. That is our new home. At the moment we're like exiles. But the bride, the church is to be encouraged. That having given up the right to call this world home. We have gained a true, perfect, glorious home. That will never fade Or pass away. And then we come to the last two verses. There's a promise here. Of offspring and an eternal name. And surely this is great encouragement to the bride. Except for one thing. These verses are not spoken to the bride. In these verses the Hebrew you is masculine. 
So the psalmist has turned again to the king and is speaking to the king. But of course the bride shares this promise, doesn't she? The bride shares in this promise that is given to the king of a line of kings who will reign over all the earth forever. Again, we compare this to what we know of Old Testament history. Two generations after David, that was all it took for the kingdom to split in two. They couldn't even reign over the whole of Israel, never mind the whole earth. And then, of course, give it a few hundred years and the throne of Judah disappears at the exile. But in Jesus, once again, we see the promise of those verses fulfilled. And we will see it in full at his return. In 1 Peter 1, we are assured of an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for us. We will take up the place that God designed for us at creation, reigning with Jesus over the new creation. The song to the Lamb in Revelation 5, you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. And again at the end of Revelation in chapter 22. The Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. We are included in this promise. The princes of all the earth. Who reign with the king. Until then. We remain exiles and strangers. But we are the bride of Christ. Whose very existence. And whose love for our king. For our bridegroom. Causes his name to be known. And remembered In all generations. And we pray will bring many to praise his name. So let me finish with the call that we hear in 1 Peter 2. That speaks of our royal position. Those who are the people of God. The bride of Christ. And speaks of how that royal position is by the mercy and grace of God. How that royal position does leave us in some ways as exiles here on earth. And yet enables us to represent the rule of the king here and now. 1 Peter 2. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable so that when they speak against you as evildoers they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let's pray. Father we thank you. For that incredible truth. Of who we are in Christ. People who did not deserve. To receive mercy. People who were. Stained. With sin. But who have received mercy. And been washed clean. 
People who have received mercy and been brought together as the bride of Christ. Who have been brought together as representatives of the reign of our King here on earth. Lord, we know that when we pray for your will to be done and your kingdom to come up here on earth as it is in heaven, Lord, we know we are praying that we ourselves would do your will and display your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to do that. And as we look to Christ, as we look to our heavenly bridegroom, Help us to be so overwhelmed with the glory and the joy of what you have done in calling us to be yours. Help us to be so overwhelmed that it overflows with love for for you, for one another and for a world that so desperately needs to hear of the rule of our King. Do this work in us, we pray. And even as we come now to communion, to look again to Christ, to the cost of our redemption. Help us, Lord, to worship and to serve because we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.